this all going down uh, in the full Senate after it voted earlier to end debate. We're going to keep a close eye on all the developments there throughout the show. But first to this, President Trump is now firing back at former acting FBI Director Andrew McCabe after a bombshell interview shakes the morning news cycle. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. Happy Valentine's Day. 214. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Hemmer. Good to have you along with us today. Moments ago, the president sounding off on Twitter as Mr. McCabe revealing new details about the investigation in the early uh, stages into President Trump, telling 60 Minutes that he opened the probe and he also says the Justice Department held discussions about removing the president from office under the 25th Amendment. The president tweeting, quote, disgraced FBI acting director Andrew McCabe pretends to be a, quote, poor little angel, when in fact he was a big part of the crooked Hillary scandal and the Russia hoax. A puppet for Leak and James Comey, IG report on McCabe was devastating, part of insurance policy in case I won. So he continued, many of the top FBI brass were fired, forced to leave or left. McCabe's wife received big dollars from Clinton people for her campaign. He gave Hillary a pass. McCabe is a disgrace to the FBI and a disgrace to our country. Make America great again. End of a long tweet. Chief uh, Intelligence uh, Correspondent Catherine Herridge live in Washington. And that's the latest from the president this morning. What's the latest there? Catherine, good morning. Well, thanks, Sandra. And good morning. Fox News first reported in October that FBI General Counsel James Baker told House investigators that McCabe said Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein was serious about recording the president and invoking the 25th Amendment, promoting his new book, McCabe confirms those May 2017 discussions and more to CBS News. Until now, Rosenstein and those close to the deputy attorney general have said his comments were sarcastic, but this has been at odds with testimony from Baker under oath and even more so now with McCabe's 60 Minutes interview. Rosenstein has resisted calls to come to Capitol Hill to clear up the conflict. McCabe also confirms what has been widely reported that after FBI Director James Comey was fired by the president in May 2017, there were two investigations, one into obstruction of justice for the firing and the other a counterintelligence case into alleged coordination between the Trump campaign and Moscow. I was very concerned that I was able to put the Russia case on absolutely solid ground in an indelible fashion that were I removed quickly or reassigned or fired, that the case could not be closed or uh, vanish in the night without a trace. I wanted to make sure that our case was on solid ground. An investigative source told Fox News McCabe was fired last March for committing three violations of the FBI's ethics code. They included lack of candor under oath, lack of candor not under oath, and the improper disclosure of non-public information to the media about the FBI's investigation into the Clinton Foundation. McCabe's case is now with the U.S. attorney here in Washington, D.C., Sandra. Catherine, what's the DOJ's response? Mm -hmm. Well, in the last few minutes, this statement was issued by the Justice Department, and it says Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein never authorized a recording or invoking of the 25th Amendment. But on its face, that does stop short of denying that these issues were ever discussed. It reads in part, the Deputy Attorney General never authorized any recording that Mr. McKay references, as the Deputy Attorney General previously has stated, based on his personal dealings with the President, there is no basis to invoke the 25th Amendment, nor was the Deputy Attorney General or DAG in a position to consider invoking the 25th Amendment. And that will certainly not be the last we hear of this story today, Sandra. All right, Catherine Herridge mm -hmm. in Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. Do we have a deal? Lawmakers racing against the clock to get a, a deal done by the midnight deadline Friday night to avoid another shutdown, waiting to see whether or not the White House likes the idea they've come up to with together. First up, though, here's Senator Lindsey Graham. He's making the case that the president should take this deal. The 1.375 can be used to build barriers. Nancy Pelosi said not a dollar for barriers or wall. He's going to get almost four, uh, uh, you know. Uh, 1.375. Yeah, he's going to get a lot more than a dollar. He's going to get money for more judges. Nobody talks about that. There is no limit on bed space like I was worried about. So take this as a down payment. Go into the uh, defense bill and move money around like Congress allowed you to do last year and build this damn wall. Well. <laughs> 
There you have it from last night with Shannon. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is watching all the balls in the air up there today. Hey, Mike, good morning. Bill, good morning to you. The Senate will go first by voting on this bipartisan border security package. A key Senate Democrat says it will pass, and he's expecting President Trump to sign what he considers a pretty solid deal. Border security, improving the ports of entry considerably. Uh, we had various initiatives that included Republicans putting ideas forward to tackle a broader immigration bill, to tackle the Dreamers. This is probably the best that could be done, but we have to come back to these issues. The message from the Senate Majority Leader at this stage is it is time to get this done. It goes without saying that neither side is getting everything it wants. That's the way it goes in divided government. If the text of the bill reflects the principles agreed to on Monday, it won't be a perfect deal, but it'll be a good deal. Then it goes over to the House for a vote this evening, and Speaker Nancy Pelosi is selling it as a win for the American people. Pelosi notes it's a compromise, and that's what congressional appropriators do. Pelosi is urging that people support the bill for what's in it, not what is lacking. After that pitch, House members will have their chance to vote up or down on the border security package. I'm not excited about it. I'm probably going to be a yes unless there's some surprise, but that's why you really do have to go through these things and make sure something unexpected was not snuck in. There is some thought a big bipartisan vote in the Senate will help vote totals in the House. Then, of course, it is up to President Trump, and certainly many folks up here are hoping he will sign it, Bill. Busy 36 hours. Mike, thanks for that. Maybe you beyond. Bet. Let's bring in our A-team right now. Great A-team. Jessica Tarla, Fox News contributor. Lisa Boo, senior fellow, independent women's voice. James Freeman from the Wall Street Journal. Where's the red? Uh, well, you know, I Sandra actually... Sandra wore it. Yeah, Sandra did it for all of us. I'm, I'm looking Sandra. for, like, the, a, a bipartisan the sartorial decision <laughs> here. Okay? No, I, I won't she, she bangs on me all the time. Hammer, you quit. Wear a red tie. Well, you, so... You, you guys look great. The this ladies appreciate it. I did. Yes. I woke up this morning thinking about this panel and studying for it as opposed to what I was and you, well, well, what you so. came up with is the Green New Deal. I did. Oh, no, did. no, no, that, no. That's no, what no. you've got. For the uh, record, no. Uh, border <laughs> deal. Does he take it or not? Uh, I, I think he will, but look, you already have groups like FAIR and Center for Immigration Studies that are flagging things like Section 224, which is basically saying that any sponsor or any person that accompanies an unaccompanied minor cannot be detained or removed. So that is a big problem because you're essentially giving them de facto sanctuary. So I think a lot of people are going to be combing through this bill today, and there's going to be problems with the you know actual language that is in this as opposed to just the big picture items. But I honestly think that this is good for the president, and I'm not trying to spin that. I mean this truly because these discussions between Democrats and Republicans have been illuminating for the American people. You look at Democrats that were kicking and screaming about increased border security along the southern border in terms of a wall. You have Democrats that wanted to reduce detention beds making it more difficult for ICE to do its job in removing criminal legal aliens. You even look at things like the State of the Union, where Democrats brought illegal immigrants to the State of the Union, and Republicans brought uh, angel families, also brought law enforcement. So I think the difference is stark, and President Trump ran as the law enforcement president. I think we're going to be seeing that again but for you, him you said you're trending. You're trending toward a yes. In that answer. I do think he's going to do it reluctantly just because you look at the Senate, Republicans have a 53 seat majority, but they don't have a filibuster proof majority. So there's not much Republicans can do alone in the Senate in terms of passing a legislation and putting that pressure on a Democrat controlled House. But it's not a sure thing, right, James? So throw up yep. some of what, what we know is in this border deal. A lot we don't know because it is over a thousand pages long, but 2.37 billion uh, for general procurement, construction improvements. That The next number is that 1.4 billion. Uh, for fencing, $725 million for technology. Democrats have been asking for that. $270 million for facility improvements. And path to reduction in ICE detention beds. Does the president, or will he be willing to sign this legislation? Well, I certainly think he can point to that new metal barrier that's going to go into the Rio Grande Valley as a win. It's not uh, all hundreds of miles that he wanted, and it, uh, it's not the full $25 billion, obviously, a lot less than that. But he can say this is a beginning to creating new barriers, uh, addressing what uh, people who think this is a problem uh, say is the, the biggest uh, area of the problem. I, just, I think it's disappointing that this deal doesn't have anything about 
allowing more people to come here legally, which he has said over and over again in recent weeks he's opened it. We have a worker shortage in the U.S., a million more open positions than unemployed people. He said people. it in a State of the Union address. Right? Yes. But it's and not in this deal. It's no, it's not. And I, I think that's, uh, yeah. that's a disappointment. I wish the Democrats uh, had given him more wall money for, for more immigration. Why wouldn't Republicans and Democrats come together on that? Yeah, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't think it got discussed much. And, and we hear rhetoric, I think, from both sides about solutions that they want. Uh, I think on the Democratic side, clearly stopping the wall was a bigger priority than resolving Involving people who were brought here right, illegally. Jessica, your witness. It's <laughs> I think if you listen to the 2020 hopefuls that have already gotten in there, Amy Klobuchar, who was with Brett Baer earlier this week, talking about comprehensive immigration reform, I think that's where we will be talking about upping the number of legal immigrants. I think the priority here was to keep the government open. The shutdown was no good for anyone politically, certainly not for the American people. And in the end, the president shut down the government for 35 days and ended up with less money than he had beforehand because Chuck Schumer was offering him $1.6 billion. Democrats will certainly look at this as a win with the lowering of the number of ICE detention beds, though I have seen, I haven't read the full thousand pages, but there is some flexibility with There's how many beds they can get in there. Uh, but net net, this is not something that the president wanted. He wanted his 5.7 billion, or at least to meet halfway. So and Coulter is not happy, and you know it's bad news for him. By the way, Nancy Coulter Pelosi not didn't want a dollar going to well, a, one a, dollar. a beaded curtain would cost something, though. Well, uh, but no, she didn't want a dollar. Bed, bed, but this is border security, and people have been playing semantics with it. This is not a wall. This is bollard fencing, 55 miles, which is a fraction of what the president okay. wanted. But that's and a you semantics can, Hang on one game. second, Lisa. We're going to come it back to this. Been. We have plenty to talk about. when we get to Covington Catholic now with Sam. Because there is now an investigation that has found no evidence of racist or offensive statements in that mall incident. And now we're hearing from uh, the diocese itself. The Covington Diocese has put out a statement reacting. The immediate worldwide reaction to this initial video led almost everyone to believe that our students had initiated the incident and the perception of those few minutes of video became reality. It's a lengthy statement. But that is from the Bishop of Covington as we all continue to look back at that moment. And now this Evidence they're, they're evidence. actually applauding the students for the way they reacted and the way they held their own verbal fire at a time that was very tense if you take in all the evidence, James. Yeah, this is a, they commissioned an independent study, pretty thorough investigation, look, doing hundreds of hours of interviews, looking at uh, various film, uh, social media from the event, uh, coming to the same conclusion I think uh, uh, much of the media has now begrudgingly accepted, which is that uh, these kids were, were kind of uh, uh, criticized uh, and, and condemned initially. That was wrong. They didn't initiate it. They had exercised some admirable self-restraint. And I'm waiting for some more retractions, not just deleted tweets from uh, a lot of our colleagues in the media industry. There, there's still a lot of uh, uncorrected reporting sitting out there online uh, that blames these kids but for the But at least event. for now, Lisa, they have officially, on the record, been cleared of any wrongdoing. Well, yeah, which if anyone had waited a decent amount of time to get the full picture, they would have known that because that immediately became clear after just this initial clip went viral and you had people of the media condemn these kids really without looking at the evidence. And you wonder why people do not trust the media. You wonder why Trump supporters do not trust the media. I don't know how to crystallize it. This, this makes it crystal clear why they do not. The only crimes these kids committed were being pro-life and wearing a MAGA hat and being Trump supporters. That was the crime they committed, and that was enough for the media. And that, in tandem with the fact that Nathan Phillips was Native American, that's all the media needed to do to run wild with this, you know, fake news story marring and tarring these high schoolers. It's disgusting. We've we got to fly quickly, Jessica. Oh, I... I think that this is what people wanted the Catholic Church to do from the beginning, which is to stand by. They threw your them kids under the bus before initially, the bus they, got back home. Right, but I would say to your point about that, you know, this puts it to rest. It will not put it to rest for a number of people who, even if the archdiocese says that, do see it differently. And this conversation will continue about uh, he, here's what my these sense. kids were doing, what Nathan Phillips Social was doing. Social media, and the, there's so much trolling that goes on 
Okay, there's, there, it's very easy to destroy the life and the reputation of just about anyone. Mm. And here is a case where you have salvation. I think that's what we need to think about here. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Thank, Thank you, James. You both. Happy Valentine's Day. Come. Yes. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Go Just put on your red. Green, <laughs> Green New Deal. <laughs> no. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Well, they say nothing is a given except death and taxes, unless you're Amazon. Why, the company's tax bill is exactly zero, plus there's this. Never been a country in the history of the world where a working class kid like me could have aspired to that level of success with any chance of achieving it. There you have it. Former CEO Andy Puzzler saying that he's a big beneficiary of the American dream. Now he's talking about it, about recent, uh, well, the new rise of socialist ideas on the left, how he reacts to all of that. So he's going to join us here, Sandra, a bit later this hour. Come on. And the economy is sending some mixed messages as the White House says it's clicking on all cylinders. The money man Charles Payne is up next on a brand new report out on the Jim economy. Trump ended the war on business and he ended the war on success and he's sending messages open up the economy with low taxes and deregulation. While Amazon may not be so worried about April 15th, the tech giant will pay exactly nothing in federal oh. income taxes for the second year in a row. Doug McKelvey is live in Washington with more on this. Doug. Hi, Sandra. The legal fight between Amazon chief Jeff Bezos and the National Enquirer has made a lot of headlines, but Amazon is embroiled in another big story this tax season. It pays virtually nothing in federal taxes, despite being one of the most profitable U.S. companies. In fact, it doubled its profits in just the last year alone, now up to $11.2 billion in 2018. Its tax burden is negligible, and it's done nothing wrong. Thanks to the tax code crafted by Congress, it is entitled to any number of exemptions and tax credits. Like other U.S. companies, it can deduct costs for research and development. Also deductible are profits from stocks paid to executives. And while Internet companies didn't used to have to pay state taxes on e-commerce, in 2017 that did change and Amazon began adding sales taxes in states that required it. President Trump has been a huge critic of Amazon, in part, uh, not just because of the tax situation, but because uh, owner Bezos uh, also owns the Washington Post, a frequent Trump critic. But the president, as you'll recall, in his prior business dealings, has benefited from the very same tax advantages as Amazon. Remember this? Maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes, because the only years that anybody's ever seen were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license, and they showed he didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. Paid that makes me smart, he just said there. A reminder, there is a downside to all those tax advantages and corporate cuts. The economy may be booming. Unemployment is at record lows, but tax receipts are down. In 2018, corporate tax slipped 17 percent from October through December from the previous year. Back to you guys in New York. What a story. Doug McElway, thank you. Pretty good deal. It is strong. Consumption is strong. Because jobs are roaring and unemployment is low across the board, incomes after inflation are very strong. Well, there's Larry Kudlow, last hour with us here. White House economic advisor, time for the money man, Charles Payne, with us here in studio. Nice to see you. You heard Kudlow selling the virtues of the economy. I see a few potholes out there as we went over yeah. during the interview. What did you think of his message? Well, his message is always pretty strong and upbeat and optimistic, and, and it's backed up by, by, by a, a lot of facts and, and overall momentum. But, you know, we did have a, a really shocking uh, report out this morning on retail sales for December. It came in significantly uh, worse than anticipated. In fact, I think it's the biggest plunge since maybe 2005 nine years. or something yeah. like that. A big, Why? long time. Uh, every category was down. It, there are theories because you don't necessarily know initially, but a lot, a lot of people are tying it to the, to the plunge in the stock market. Remember, December was the worst month for the stock market since the Great Depression. So as you have people thinking about going out to do their Christmas shopping or their holiday shopping, and they take a look at their portfolio, they kind of take a pause. Uh, of course, there's a lot of talk of recession, a lot of negative headlines. All that stuff conspires against someone who may want to go out and splurge. And, uh, you know, so it was certainly a shock. 
Uh, and it's going to be interesting now to see where some of these more up-to-date uh, numbers come. By the way, this will also hit fourth quarter GDP. There's a component of this that was down significantly called the control group. So that lowers our GDP, which is everyone thought would be about 2.7% for the fourth quarter, maybe under 2.5%. Uh, by the way, what was the market doing right. today? Markets are the market reacted to this number. Yeah. Now, it's interesting yeah. because we were up, we were up 74, then we were down 200, and now we're down 100 because this is very backward looking, and with the market coming back as well as it has, and all the employment data we've seen since then, there's a sense that maybe the pent up, that the buying that people didn't do in December, maybe they'll start to do it now. All right. Okay. So all a right. lot of you may remember this moment from the other evening when the coffee man, presidential contender Howard <laughs> Schultz, reacted to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's tax plan. He said this: People who are in the bracket of making millions of dollars, or whatever the number might be should be paying more taxes. What I, I think is what being proposed at 70% is a punitive number, and I think there are better ways to do this. As he's talking about the 70%, that seems to be a launching off point for some of these Democrats uh, and their tax plans that they're touting. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has responded. She's firing back in this tweet. Uh, remember that their plan equals no plan, she said. Why? Because for billionaires, things are already going fine. Yeah, and that's to suggest that if we tax the heck out of billionaires, if we take all their money, we confiscate it, we just snatch it, that it will make life better for every other American. And that's just a false, uh, a false narrative there. Listen, we had a 90% tax rate, a 91% tax rate in the 1950s. Uh, the upper 1%, the wealthy at that time, their real tax rate, their effective tax rate, not the one that was stated, not the nominal one, was 16%. Mm -hmm. uh, people find a way to hide money, to shift money around, or to find other ways not to pay a high income tax. In but, fact, but she, a lot said, of those billionaires don't even have high salaries. Schultz is saying he should be paying more taxes. That's a right. quote from it. Look, now that's I irony. should be paying more taxes. All right, then you would say cut a check. Schultz, uh, well, of course, I would say to Schultz, uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates also saying he would like to see, he would like to pay more, but they think the income tax is a. Is a, a my point, they can't pay. That's of course they can. Them from give it away. More. Give it all. Instead, they want, and, and that's the problem is that uh, they, they actually create. Uh, sort of, they, they, it's like someone climbs a mountain and then they pull up the ladder. Because now no one else can duplicate what Bill Gates has done or Howard Schultz has done. If they put in these onerous taxes that stop someone who just finally made a million dollars, not a billion, but a million, you want to crush that person. Maybe the first person in their family to make that kind of money. Maybe they could put their little brothers into college. Maybe they could buy a house. No, you want to snatch it from them, the first generation to make a million, even though you're a billionaire. That's the fallacy with these guys, with these progressive billionaires who are okay with higher taxes. There he is, the money man. <laughs> See you. Four o'clock for you. Oh, by the way, Amazon didn't pay any taxes last year, but that's a different story. <laughs> to come full circle. How do we get on that deal, right? Oh, boy. Thank you, Charles. All right. Talk to you later. See you later. Okay, here's some hey. faces from freshman members of Congress. Democrats moving further left, and that brings us to two big questions. Does America share their vision? Is it causing friction within party leaders? We're going to talk about all that coming up here, Sam. Plus, lawmakers hammering out a deal on border security. It will head to the Senate first and the House and then the president. Will the drama finally be over? The deadline's tomorrow. We'll put all these questions to a Democrat congressman next. As we review the new proposal from Congress, I can promise you this. I will never waver from my sacred duty to defend this nation and its people. We will get the job done. Somber moment in Washington, D.C. A funeral mass now getting underway in the nation's capital. Number of dignitaries present for the longest serving member of Congress ever. Family and friends and colleagues gathering to pay tribute to former Michigan Congressman John Dingell and Jillian Turner is live outside the church in Washington, D.C. And Jillian, good morning, Mayor. Good morning to you, Bill. The funeral is about to get underway here in Washington in the Georgetown neighborhood at Holy Trinity Catholic Church. Congressman John Dingell's casket has arrived. They're bringing it up the steps inside the church behind me. We've been tracking the arrivals here all morning long. It's a truly bipartisan, truly illustrious group of lawmakers uh, and Washington leaders that have turned out to honor the late congressman. He's going to be eulogized later this morning by Democratic congressman and civil rights leader John Lewis, former Republican Speaker of the House, 
John Boehner, current House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, and former President Bill Clinton. So those honoring him with eulogies are also a truly uniquely bipartisan group here today. Congressman Ingle is best known for his hand in transforming some major domestic policy issues here in the United States. Everything from voting and civil rights to U.S. health care to um, environmental programs over the last 50 years while serving in the U.S. Congress. But speaking to his friends and family, and former colleagues inside the church earlier this morning, they tell me that the shining beacon in his life was always his family, his two sons, two daughters, and his wife, current Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. She took over his seat um, just a few years ago, though despite being a Republican, she's been carrying on his legacy with many of the issues at hand today. Um, a traditional Catholic service bill would last about an hour, but because of the eulogies we're expecting here today, uh, we think it's going to go on for probably about two hours. So we will keep you posted. A life of service. Thank you, Jillian Turney. Debbie Dingle was with Sandra and me about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and she was so sweet. And yeah. um, it was great to have her on with us today and our, our thoughts with the family there in Washington, D.C., and back in Michigan as well. Our next guest is a Democrat from the state of Illinois, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy. We welcome him now. Congressman, yes. welcome to you this morning uh, to America's Newsroom as we say farewell to the former Michigan Congressman. Your thoughts? Uh, well, John Dingell was a giant. Uh, in the United States Congress. Uh, he accomplished so much in 59 years, including the signing into law of Medicare, uh, a very popular program. Uh, he conducted tremendous oversight on the Energy and Commerce Committee, so he accomplished a lot in 59 years. And then later in life, he accomplished a lot in 280 characters. He was known for his uh, wit and brevity, um, even into his later years, so a real giant in America. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you, sir, for sharing that. And now you get Thank back you. to business. I don't know what he would think about the back and forth, but I'm sure he's got a lot of thoughts about the border wall and the yes. issues that are that are before you now. And speaking of that, let's get to it. Mac Thornberry, Republican last hour, said the following about maybe a deal, maybe not. Watch here. A lot of this we have passed before, but you want to look for surprises. You want to make sure you know what's in there. It does include a lot more than one dollar for border wall. Uh, so it's got some good. It, it's got some bad. Are you a yes at the moment or not, sir? I'm a yes. Uh, I think that senior Democrats and Republicans came together, made an evidence-based assessment of what's needed at the border, and arrived at a compromise. So I will be voting for this. You heard Mac Thornberry, though. He said he's going to be looking for any surprises. Do you think there are any surprises in there that would prevent the president from signing this legislation? I don't think so. Um, certainly, everybody should uh, look at the, uh, the text and the language, and 11, we're doing that as well. 1,100 pages. Tough to do. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of text. Um, but uh, that being said, I do think that everyone should look at the bill uh, before they uh, end up voting. And I will be uh, looking at uh, text and summaries of text and so forth today. But I think that everyone should vote for this and we should move on with the rest of the business of the 116th Congress. Okay, well, there's a lot of business to get to. Two more topics we want to get to, okay? From yes, foxnews.com. Yes, Here is the headline, sir. From Omar to Ocasio Cortez, the headline reads Outspoken House Freshman Creating Friction with Democratic Leaders. How are you going to lasso this, sir? Well, look, uh, you know. I think everyone uh, should be able to speak their minds and propose what they believe their constituents want. Um, that being said, uh, I think that uh, we are um, going into the 116th Congress with a mandate to serve as a check and balance on the administration, but also to get things done. And to get things done, that's going to require a compromise with Republicans and, of course, uh, coming together within our own but caucus. But they are very outspoken, as you well know, and they've made it no secret that they're not going to hold back. Do they speak for you, sir? Uh, it depends on the issue. Um, you know, I think that where do you um, agree? I speak for myself. Where, right on. Where do you agree with them? Well, I think um, uh, where I agree with them is that we have to create an economy that allows everyone to get on the up escalator of the economy, so to speak. If you're working poor, you should be able to get into the middle class. If you're in the middle class, you should be able to survive and prosper. And then if you want to start a small business and, and help your community and country, we want you to succeed as well. Interesting. The, the Green New Deal, where do you fall on that? 
Well, it's bold. Uh, it sets a goal. But I think that my constituents are asking two questions. One, um, who's going to pay for it? And two, what are the details? And those are the types of questions that we always get from our constituents. And so until those get answered, I'm still looking and learning. Well, we, we, all, we all would like to know the details of that. Pretty vague still. Um, meanwhile, Congressman, here is the latest from the former acting FBI director, Andrew McCabe, in a fascinating interview. Want to get your reaction? Watch this first. I was able to put the Russia case on absolutely solid ground in an indelible fashion that were I removed quickly or reassigned or fired, that the case could not be closed or uh, vanish in the night without a trace. I wanted to make sure that our case was on solid ground and if somebody came in behind me and closed it and tried to walk away from it, they would not be able to do that without creating a record of why they'd made that decision. It's a fascinating interview here. The Department of Justice Deputy Attorney General has basically kicked to the curb everything he has said. Sir, what in the world was going on at the FBI? What in the world was happening at the Department of Justice? Yes, sir. So, um, as you know, I think in May 2017 or thereabouts, um, uh, Mr. Comey was fired by the president, and that shocked everyone, Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill, and certainly uh, officials at the DOJ and FBI. Um, and then eight days later, after the firing, Special Counsel Mueller was appointed, and um, there was a consensus opinion at the time that that was the right decision. Um, that being said, um, I think that uh, important questions are raised, even in that one-minute clip that you uh, aired of the 60 Minutes clip. I, I wonder what the other 59 here, minutes are going to be like. You are precisely right about that. We were asking the same thing. How much more does he talk about? Now, Republican colleagues are saying we have no collusion that we have found more than two years later after this investigation was launched. So let's go ahead and wrap it up. Would you agree with that? Well, I think that uh, the special counsel Mueller inquiry uh, should be allowed to proceed unimpeded. Um, I slightly disagree with uh, some of those folks that say that there's no evidence of a conspiracy. So or where is like the that. evidence? What have you found? Well, I think that um, you know, if you just look in the uh, in the public uh, domain, um, you have a lot of evidence of uh, contacts, uh, very strange contacts between uh, Trump. Uh, affiliates or his organization and uh, folks on the other side in Russia and they're still investigating the nature of those contacts let's let them okay, finish let, their let inquiry. Let me ask you a very specific question. We gotta run. We're way out of time. Yes, sir. Do you believe yes, sir. you have evidence of collusion? Yes or no? Um, as you know collusion is not a crime. Conspiracy is and so I think that is really where the inquiry should go and uh, I'm, I'm not going to make a judgment on that until the it's, uh, investigation it's February is completed. It's 2019. Last word. Yes, sir. Uh, as a former prosecutor in Illinois, I said investigate, then prosecute. So let's finish the investigation. Okay. I don't know. I sense a little gray hair. You, thank you for coming on today. Yes, sir. Hope yes, you Bill. Come back, thank you. Okay? Thank you, All Sandra. Right. Thank, right. thank you, Bill. I appreciate having you. Thank, thank you, Congressman. You. Well, the battle of socialism versus capitalism playing out right now. We don't need the government telling people what to eat, telling people where to go, telling people what they can do, you know, telling people who work that they have to support people who don't want to work. So will the goals of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders ever really become a reality? We'll put that to our headliner this morning, Andy Puzder, will weigh in straight ahead. Also speaking of socialism, President Trump will be given a speech on Venezuela as the country teeters on the brink of collapse. Brett Baer just had a big interview with the Colombian president. He's going to join us in about 20 minutes, top of the next hour. Come on back. Versus socialism. It's not even close. Take a look at these numbers. People's views on capitalism overwhelmingly positive, approving it over socialism by more than two to one. Our headliner has a new op-ed out on this very issue, Andy Puzder, former CEO of CKE Restaurants and author of the book, The Capitalist Comeback, The Trump Boom and the Left's Plot to Stop It. We welcome you, Andy. Great to have you on the program this morning. And you look at the discussion and the conversation that is being had in this country right now and the amount of times we hear socialism mentioned in the halls of Congress. Did you ever think you would see this time? Well, I, I never did. I, at the end, you remember at the end of the, uh, you probably don't, you're too young, but when the Soviet Union collapsed back in 1991, the big joke was that the only place you could find a socialist was the faculty lounge at Harvard. Mm. And you know, now that has spread. The, the idea of socialism has spread very widely, although they try and cover it up. 
they try and say, look, we're not like the socialism of the Soviet Union or Cuba, North Korea or Venezuela. We're this new kind of socialism, which is one of the problems with the Green New Deal is it's the old kind of socialism. By the way, that poll you mentioned, uh, that was taken between the 10th and the 12th of February. The Green New Deal was released on the 7th of February. So that may actually have influenced some of this polling. People might be saying, whoa, that's not what we, that's not what we signed up for. That's not what we want. Well, what do you want people to know about that Green New Deal? We don't know a lot about it. I mean, we, we, we were able to read through the initial pages that were put out and the suggestions that were made. What did you think when you saw it? Well, I thought two things. Number one, it, it really put the lie to the notion that the kind of socialism that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders are talking about is some new kind of socialism. These are old socialist five-year programs, just like they had in the Soviet Union. They even talk about the government just printing money to pay for these programs. Well, look at Venezuela. They've got a thousand percent inflation because the government's uh, currency has no value. It has no respect around the world. So the first thing is it's the old kind of socialism. The second thing is whether you believe in climate change, whether you believe in global warming or not, and I don't want to debate that here. There's people that are more expert on that than me for sure. But whether or not you believe it, it's clear now that the socialists are going to use the scare of global warming and climate change as